Welcome to our event today. I'm very excited to be here with you all. Um, my name is Zach Stafford. I am the for former editor-in-chief of The Advocate Magazine. I'm currently on MSNBC, and I'm a board member of the American LGBTQ Plus Museum, uh, which is a very exciting endeavor that I'm very excited to be a part of. We are still building the museum. I can let Ben talk a bit about that in a bit. Um, but tonight we're talking about Kansas City and Missouri and all the incredible work that's been done there and is going on there and also the battles that the state has faced that are foundational to our great American LGBTQ history. So before we get going, I want to put us all in the same context today, the same state of mind um, and show you some photos if you never saw the exhibition itself and give you some background and then I'm going to introduce my esteemed panelists, and then we're gonna have a conversation. And at the end of the conversation, you can ask questions. We only have 15 minutes, but ask some questions. Please think of questions. Ask anything in the chat box and I will screen them. Um, you cannot ask for anyone's number. You cannot ask for any love advice. You can only ask about what we're talking about today, uh, which is about love, but not your own ones. So those are the ground rules. Enjoy the show and let's get going. So Lucy, could you start the presentation for me? Thank you. So the exhibition we're talking about today is called Making History, Kansas City and the Rise of Gay Rights. It's a traveling ex exhibit, which was made in 2017 by students at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. And it focuses on gay rights groups from the 1950s and the struggle for the LGBTQ community there and nationally. Um, and it was installed in the Kansas uh, City Capitol building in, on August 27th. So this is a marker. Uh, speaking to the Phoenix Society uh, for Individual Freedom, which was formed in 1966. It's the first organization in Kansas City that addressed the needs of the gay and lesbian communities. There was also a paper, we'll see in a second, that was one of the first uh, LGBTQ magazines, newspapers, which I'm very fond of. Um, so we go to the next slide, please. And here is the exhibition stage within the Capitol itself. Um, so, you know, there are different banners speaking to different moments within the history of Kansas City specifically, um, and speaking to how these small moments are really foundational to the larger movement that became the LGBTQ rights, not just a movement, not just in Kansas City, Missouri, but nationally as well. Um, so again, more there um, that you could see. And this also was in other locations, but what we're talking about today is specifically at the Capitol. And then here is the Phoenix, which is one of the first uh, periodicals for LGBTQ news um, at the same time. Just for context, just because I used to be the editor-in-chief of The Advocate, we also launched at the same time in 1967. Um, so this was a big moment nationally where you saw a lot of uh, newspapers and magazines launch that were, for the first time ever, speaking about LGBTQ rights in a national or very public way, which was really, really big and very legal in many ways, but it was very amazing. Um, so once the exhibition goes up, we begin to see some backlash um, bubbling around the city on social media. Um, but the exhibition is up for a few days. And then on August 31st, 2021, it, uh, it goes down, it disappears. And we're gonna talk about that today. What happened and what this moment means for larger uh, movements and how the erasure of LGBTQ history and other oppressed groups is kind of feeding into the moment we're seeing today. Here's some of the reporting about what happened that day. Um, and Senator Razor will talk to us a bit in a second about that. But he was interviewed a lot that day. I remember this day very well. <laughs> um, but it made big, big news. Um, and also for context, President Trump is president at the time. Uh, it's just 2021. Um, and, you know, it's a lot going on in America. And, you know, today we're still seeing these conversations happen still. Um, and then again, more coverage there. And then you can see the exhibition online after this, if you'd like, there is a website that you can view it, check it out. So there you go, this is what we're talking about today. So to begin, if I can have the Senator talk to us about this day and how he found out, I hear there's a funny story about how you found out uh, about these shenanigans at the Capitol. Yeah, well, thanks Zach for hosting and for the museum for putting this together and, and spotlighting Missouri. This is um, a sad part of our LGBTQ history that one day will be told in a history exhibit in our capital. Uh, we will get that done one day. Uh, so this exhibit went up, like you said, it was uh, produced by the University of Missouri, Kansas City History Department. Uh, it was placed in the Capitol, was supposed to be there for four months this past August uh, and run through December. 
it lasted about three or four days and abruptly was taken down. Uh, we found out about some of these Facebook posts from a legislative assistant uh, and subsequently found out that several uh, members of the legislature had complained to the department. So to give everyone a little bit that isn't from Missouri, a little bit of understanding, when you walk into the Missouri State Capitol building, the first floor is essentially a museum. Uh, it's our state history museum and, and there are permanent exhibits. And then every few months there are traveling exhibits that come in and out. And this one was coming uh, and had been put up. Uh, I, I found out it was taken down. Obviously, my personal history, the history of the city that I represent in the Senate had been erased from uh, the Capitol and literally put in a building to the side of the Capitol building uh, that is an old shack. Uh, that was very hard to find the building itself. Once you got there, it was hard to find where they had put the exhibit. Uh, and, you know, I made quite a fuss about it. Uh, I think what happened is these legislators uh, complained to the director. Uh, the director probably freaked out a little bit, removed the exhibit, uh, thinking that that would squash kind of any media that might come. I don't think they were anticipating uh, the fact that we would be not only in the Kansas City Star, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, uh, but be found in the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, and even some publications in Europe. Uh, so I think they hopefully learned that we can make a lot of noise as well. Yeah, and there was a lot of noise, and deservedly so. You know, Rodney, uh, I'd love to go to you. Uh, you know, you're what, the first publicly out gay public school teacher, correct, in the state of Missouri. Um, you're also the creator of LGBTQ History Month, um, which is an incredible month for obvious reasons. What did you think the day that you heard of these shenanigans going on in uh, the capital of your state, and how did you respond? I was um, shocked surprised, and I'm not sure why, actually, because I know these things happen, and I know that history is not a line that just continues toward progress and happy times. There's always a couple of steps forward and a step back, yet these things do surprise me, and more so, this particular event uh, was hurtful, actually. It sent me back 25 years, really, to the early and mid-1990s when I was a high school history teacher in St. Louis, coming out, starting LGBTQ History Month, and remembering the uproar at the time and the response at the time and some of the letters to the editor at the time. And I sort of thought we had gone beyond that. I thought we had moved past it. So when I heard that in our state capitol, a building that belongs to all the people, that a particular people's history was removed, literally erased from the state capitol. Uh, it was shocking, surprising, horrifying, and disappointing because what happens is this sort of thing creates um, a chilling effect over everyone. Everyone in the state who is LGBTQ everyone who teaches who is LGBTQ, everyone who works in museums, for all of these individuals, this is a chilling effect because suddenly someone is complaining and their complaint is taken seriously and an exhibit is removed. Yeah, and it feels a lot these days that one complaint somehow from one parent is enough to change entire policies at schools. You know, we hear in the news a lot, like one parent was upset about one kid being allowed to use the bathroom that they choose, and then the whole school is an uproar and they're fighting against one kid, which seems really unbalanced in many ways. And I'd love for Deb uh, Fowler, for you to talk to us about the work that you've been doing in schools nationally and kind of put this into context around how we're seeing lots of issues erased within schools and how this exhibition, when you first heard about it, may have echoed to a lot of the work that you do every day. Oh, yeah, certainly. I mean, as soon as we learned about the, this situation in, in Missouri, um, our social media person was blasting out immediately and, and sharing this out. It's, it's a mark of, it, it's emblematic of so much else that's happening politically, socially, culturally. History Unerased works with K-12 schools and districts across the nation and various contexts, rural, urban, suburban, um, private, public charter schools, 
but I have to say that the, 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 the common thread that's coming from what we hear in conversations with educators and school administrators and parents when we have informational sessions with parents is that, it, and we say this all the time internally, the fear is real and we're here to help. And that fear can be coming from many different spaces and many different avenues, whether it is, um, I mean, initially when we started doing this work, it was a fear of pushback from parents and caregivers. Um, there's a fear for a lot of educators who are talking with us that they're afraid of getting it wrong because mm -hmm. this content, LGBTQ history, it is fair to say that 99.9% .9 of the population has not had the opportunity to engage with this content in an academic discourse framework. And so there's a lot of myth and misperception about what LGBTQ history is. And so, you know, teachers are concerned about the language, they're concerned about not having enough fluency and proficiency with the content to answer questions from students and parents or, and caregivers. Um, something that just came up today, in fact, a few hours ago, one of my colleagues and I were on a virtual meeting session with a group of students, a couple of their teachers and a school principal. And these students have been advocating since October to bring in history and race curriculum. They sent out surveys. They garnered a lot of data about how everyone wanted to do this. And they met with, and, and they started having sessions with teachers to tell them they want this curriculum and why. And there was pushback just yesterday from a group of teachers who, it was the, the bill in Florida that is circulating and is, is doing harm in, for students and educators across the country. Um, so to what Rodney said earlier about that chilling effect, um, it's, it's dangerous. And we, we witnessed firsthand how that impacted students. But I also want to say that there's a lot of hope because students really are rising up and asking for this. There was a K to eight school in one of the states where there is one of these egregious bills circulating where a student, a collective group of students um, asked for LGBTQ inclusive curriculum. This is a K to eight school. And there's another example in Oregon where a junior your student started a petition, garnered thousands of signatures, and there's a lot of momentum coming from youth today. And as one of my colleagues has said so beautifully and well, that the rising generation is going to lead us toward a more inclusive world, literary and otherwise. Beautiful. And you know, before I, then I want you to contextualize this into like the larger history in a minute. But before we go there, I want to follow up with Devin Rodney here. If you could speak to some of kind of what you've heard for parents in the past, of what are they actually afraid of? Because that's what gets so confusing to me is that I went to school, I learned about wars, I learned about so much violent, terrible stuff, but what is it or what are they thinking LGBTQ history actually is? And even Senator, what do you think your colleagues think this history is? Because from my readings of this, it's really like very casual. It's very PG, it's nothing crazy. <laughs> I like that you said very PG because I actually also read through the entire display online and it is PG. It's about post-World War II Kansas City. It's about the early homophile movement. It's about the founding of the Phoenix Society. It's about trying to provide services for uh, lesbian and gay people in Kansas City. So there was nothing there at all that should have been problematic for, for anyone, um, which made it all the more disappointing. But you will notice in the social media post of the legislative assistant uh, who was starting the ruckus, uh, it's very much a theocratic opposition. You'll notice when it was removed, he said, to God be the glory. This was a theocratic act. 
uh, an act of a, a holy war in effect against that particular manifestation of history. You'll also notice in his social media posts, he put the word history in quote marks, therefore degrading or demeaning the value of that particular history. And he talked about preserving traditional family values. So that's what they're afraid of. They, they have an anxiety that their family will not be reflected, that their family somehow will be weakened if other families exist, that their history won't be as important and meaningful if the history of other people is also allowed an equal voice uh, in the marketplace of ideas. If I can jump in for just a moment, I serve on the Education Committee in the State Senate, and uh, we haven't talked about this particular issue, but oftentimes we have parents come in and the concerns around LGBT inclusive history uh, oftentimes revolve around discussions of sexuality and sex. It is then included with why does my son, daughter have to feel guilty for being white? This is a bigger conversation than just LGBTQ individuals, uh, but we are right there at the heart of it. Yeah, and Deb, are you seeing that in your conversations? Do they see your curriculum being put in schools as an example of something being taken away from straight people? Can they not see these things as being together? Because I always tell people, you know, we're, I would say we're 10% of the total population, even though we're less than that a little bit, but one day we will be 10%, which means we are 10% of every single conversation. So I feel like there's enough space for us and we're also not gonna take over the whole conversation. But what are the conversations like for you when you have them in the schools with the parents? Yeah, so when we work with um, educators or parents, stakeholders, we provide a generative space for them to think about where it, it's, it's not really the change itself that they're afraid of, but that fear of loss, that there's a perception that this is somehow a zero sum game. Um, so helping them unpack what that fear may be generated from, what are they afraid of losing? For some parents, and honestly, this just came up a few hours ago, um, they're afraid that they're going to lose their straight child because if they engage with this content, it's going to uh, facilitate an exploration that they're not comfortable with. And it so often is rooted in two things, religion and sexuality. Although the introduction of LGBTQ history is not about religion and is not about sexuality. So really, you know, helping to address that head on and unpack it and help folks think about, okay, where is the resistance really coming from? Where is that discomfort really coming from? And not only within themselves, but their perceptions of other stakeholders. Mm -hmm. That's a, uh, that's interesting. It can be a really impactful process. Yeah, I mean, you say the word perception, which makes you want to go to Ben, who I've been keeping on the back burner this whole time. And I feel like that's a great place for you to enter, Ben, because you've been working in museums for quite some time and thinking about how museums themselves can be spaces of, you know, talking about power, place, people, identities, but also reimagining what people think happened with what actually happened. So what did you think about this moment in history when you saw this exhibition taken down and how does it play into larger themes you see throughout the country right now around how museums are trying to preserve conversations and tell the real histories of what happened in the world and not be erased? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I just really want to thank Deb and Rodney and Senator Razor for, for being here um, tonight. This story in Missouri is, is such an important one because you're seeing sort of all the, all the aspects of this. You're, you know, this is an, uh, an exhibit that um, became a flashpoint in, in the culture war that's happening. You know, this has been a really intense year for LGBTQ folks and uh, legislation. The, um, you know, it's, it's the worst year for anti-LGBTQ legislation since uh, 2015. There's more than 250 anti-LGBTQ bills that have been introduced in state legislatures around the country this year. Half of them are aimed at transgender youth. And so we've got this phenomenon, um, you know, that is, you know, playing again and again, over and over again, where sort of the youngest members of our community, the ones who have 
um, the least access to, to power are the ones who are targeted and become um, the symbols, um, you know, or the, you know, the, uh, the fear mongering sort of centers around, you know, what's going to happen to children. And these are children who, uh, you know, young people who are so much more real self-realized and aware and um, sophisticated and nuanced about aspects of their identity related to uh, queerness or gender. Um, you know, so I've been working in Ohio for the past two and a half years, and I'm still here in Columbus before moving to New York to, um, uh, because I just started uh, in my role as executive director for the American LGBTQ Plus Museum this week. And I've been working at a state history organization here. And so when I heard about this, um, it was something again, that I think all of us who work in museums are thinking about or who are working in majority culture museums. When you're working in, for a, a state entity, um, there is always, uh, you know, there's, there's just sort of a stronger, more inherent political read on anything that happens. Uh, you know, a museum in a state house, it's very difficult for a state museum and one that's situated in a state house to have a real independent curatorial perspective and voice. Uh, my colleague, Nina Simon, who was a museum director and um, runs an inclusive museum uh, organization, talks about the fact that museums need to be space makers for risk takers. Our, our job as museums is to create a, state, a space that protects the people we invite in to present their ideas and stories and um, exhibitions um, because they're taking risks, they're opening themselves up. And so that's so much harder to do when you're located um, in the literal seat of you know, political power. Um, and so I think, you know, one of the beautiful things about this uh, American LGBTQ plus museum um, is that we are going to be able to tell these stories unapologetically um, and clearly and in ways that is, you know, is very difficult for um, other museums to do. So I have an enormous amount of respect for my colleagues who work in state history organizations, who work in state house museums, who work at the Smithsonian, because this happens at the federal level as well. Um, some of us might remember, you know, a very famous instance in the mid '90s when an exhibition about the bombing um, at the uh, at the end of World War II by the Enola Gay um, at the Air and Space Museum was canceled um, because it was providing a perspective that, um, you know, focused on the humanity of the, of the victims in Japan. Um, and, you know, the Smithsonian works very hard and under the leadership of Lonnie Bunch has been very successful in having a really independent perspective and curatorial voice, but that's, it's just very difficult to do. And so we need culturally specific museums. We need museums where um, the story can be told uh, at sort of full force and unapologetically. Yes, I agree completely. And, you know, Senator, I'd love to hear from you how the ripping of this exhibition down at the Capitol, which is not in Kansas City, it's in Jefferson uh, City, um, how has that rippled through the work that you're doing there? And has there been more efforts to make sure that things like this don't happen? Like, can we make sure the Capitol stays to be a public space for multiple conversations to have at once, or is all lost <laughs> in this effort? All is not lost. So um, I want to follow up on something that Ben just said about how difficult it is to run a museum in a space like a state capitol building because it is inherently always political, which I was very conscious of when I got to be so public because I knew if one side of the aisle is going to be so strong against our history, I'm gonna to have to hit back and say, you can't erase us without a headache. Uh, and that was really a big part of the point um, is making sure that they knew that, hey, I am here uh, and, and a Senator and, and one of only 34 in the state of Missouri, and you're gonna to have to listen to me and my history. Um, you know, now that we've moved on, uh, we have seen, I've talked to folks at UMKC who say that the exhibit, uh, they have two, uh, replicas of it. 
They are booked up for three years around the Midwest. Uh, a group in St. Louis uh, came together and found the money to have a third one built just for the St. Louis metro area that they are moving around uh, the space. But in the Capitol building, you know, we're, we're back in session from January through May. Uh, we're in a winter storm at the moment, so I'm at home. Uh, but we are now focused on legislation. And that means while trying to uh, pass progressive legislation towards LGBTQ people, really this is going to be the year where, where we have to stand in the way of anti-trans legislation and especially legislation facing trans youth. Um, the, I think one of the, we've heard a lot about filibusters in DC I think they could take a lesson from Missouri where we have what's called a standing filibuster. So as a Senator, I can take the floor and talk until I fall down uh, and I don't have to stay on subject, but I may maybe reaching out to, to some of you on the panel because we are going to learn some about LGBT history uh, in the Missouri Senate if this comes to the floor uh, and I, I might need some help making sure I have all my ducks in a row uh, ready for that conversation. I think many people would love to help you on that one. Yeah. <laughs> Make it very, very gay in there. <laughs> yeah. um, well, speaking of, you know, all this wave of bills happening, how are you seeing this exhibition, if it is impacting kind of some organizing on the right in Missouri? Have people used this as an example of a win where they could keep pushing cancellations like this on LGBTQ history, Senator? No, I, I think it was definitely a loss. Uh, on that issue. I will say, you know, oftentimes, especially in states like Missouri, we look at this as Democratic and Republican issues. In the, I'm the only openly LGBT member of the Senate, but there are six in the House of Representatives, three Republicans, three Democrats. Uh, I wanna, you know, give a big shout out to my Republican colleague, Senator Lincoln Huff from Springfield, Missouri, right in the heart of the Ozarks, who made a public statement that if, if he were governor, he would have fired the director who made the decision to remove this, uh, march down to the rotunda where the exhibit was set up and explain why LGBT history should be told. Uh, and this is coming from a Republican from the Ozarks. Uh, so I've gotten a lot of um, support, uh, usually not quite that public, but support from both sides of the aisle on my stance on this. And I think it made people wake up a little bit to see, wow, this is still really happening. That's that's incredible. And I love that you're you're pointing to a more conservative place as being a place where you're finding support, uh, which brings me to Rodney, the work that you've done in the past around LGBTQ History Month, which is you know nationally, if not globally recognized now um, in places where people wouldn't think we'd be talking about that. So could you speak to us a bit about where you came up with this idea and kind of how you've seen this flourish um, over the past few years, actually? Yes, I, when I as a history teacher, I noticed that in my textbook of 800 pages, there was not a single reference to LGBT people, nothing, nothing in that textbook at all. I also was aware that I found empowering when I participated in my classroom in Women's History Month and Black History Month. It was good for my students. It was good for me. It helped me present a uh, a picture of American history that was more expansive and inclusive. So I simply thought that it would be a good idea uh, if we had uh, then called Lesbian and Gay History Month, a time in which, like February or March, we would put a spotlight on the history of LGBT people. October was picked for various reasons. A proposal was written. It was sent out to all of the then known lesbian and gay uh, groups in the country asking for support, asking if they would uh, go along with the idea, if they would endorse it and support it. And that generated a lot of interest in 1994. And by October 1994, we had the first annual. I think philosophically, my view is that access to one's history is a human right. We all have a right to access the history of the human race of the United States, of our own groups uh, that we identify with. 
And so when we try to take away history, we're really taking away a human right, a fundamental right uh, from which a person can draw so much energy, I think. It's a platform history from which we can build a better community. So lesbian and gay, then called History Month, now LGBTQ plus History Month is designed with that purpose in mind. And, and you're right, Zach, that we're now taking this concept um, around the world. Uh, the UK has a history month since 2005. Hungary has a history month. Italy this year, 2022, will have their first ever history month. And we formed an international committee, actually, where we're trying to help other locations that want to bring this concept into their own na uh, nation. That's incredible. And when this is brought to other nations, is the focus on the local histories or are you still, is, or is it a global conversation too? So is it just Italian LGBTQ history or is it global LGBTQ history? It would be specifically Italian LGBTQ history, but of course, anytime a nation is telling a history, you have a global effort, uh, a border that's blurred. In fact, LGBT History Month Scotland this year, their theme is blurring borders. Uh, a world in motion. So it's all about a transnational effort so that we can globalize, in a sense, the idea that the history of LGBT people is important wherever that history might be located. Yeah. And that's the beauty of being LGBTQ compared to other oppressed identities is that it has no geographic boundaries. It has no gender boundaries. It's not racial boundaries. It kind of exists everywhere. We are everywhere. And, you know, Deb, you're your curriculum is actually incredibly intersectional. Um, so it's not just, you know, white gay people, it's black gay people, it's black lesbian people. So can you talk about how you all use LGBTQ-ness to have an intersectional conversation and why that's been really productive for you? Yeah, so we see, as you just spoke to Rodney, uh, people who we label and understand today as LGBTQ have always existed in every nation, in every belief system, and every ethnicity in every corner and community of our world. So when we talk about unerasing LGBTQ history, we're really talking about unerasing a really critical part of human history. And the intersectionality approach, and I think Senator, you brought this up a little bit earlier about, you know, that seeing issues relating to race or gender as something separate from LGBTQ history. And it's not, it's just being, providing students with a more honest and accurate reflection of who we are as human beings collectively and individually. So we think unerasing LGBTQ history is a unique opportunity to unite people. Yeah, yeah. And it's like a new way of having the conversation. You know, I always joke about, I mean, there's many people historically that we say, we're queer, like Eleanor Roosevelt or Meriwether Lewis from Lewis and Clark. And, you know, while that may or may not be true, you know, posing that queer version of history helps us have really interesting conversations about the world around us. And it lets students be more engaged in many ways, I would argue. And Ben, that brings me to you and the work you're now beginning to do with the museum. Um, and I'd love for you to share kind of what the museum's focus is and what you, how you're thinking about capturing American LGBTQ history while thinking about things like this Kansas City exhibition, where when there are moments in which we do stage our history, it's being taken down right now. So how are you dealing with that sort of pushback as you begin to build the National Museum? Or how are you thinking about it? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, being a history organization that will be focused on a national story um, with a particular attention paid to New York as, as a site of, of LBGTQ plus history. Um, and also thinking about global, you know, uh, global resonances as well is uh, an incredibly exciting opportunity. You know, having lived in California for much of my life and, and in the Midwest, you know, I think that there is there's sometimes a perception in certain parts of the country that, um, you know, that a lot of that work is happening just in certain major metropolitan sort of coastal um, cities. But um, the stories of, of queer people who have lived uh, in the past, living today, and are, are, are coming up across the country are just extraordinary. And, and um, 
I think that we're so excited at the American LGBTQ Plus Museum to find a way to do that. We're gonna have a limited amount of physical space, but of course the, the digital space is, is infinite. We're gonna be a place to honor and remember and commemorate uh, our queer ancestors. Um, I am hoping that we will have an extremely inclusive um, entry into this museum where people can bring um, their memories and um, in some way contribute an ancestor or uh, maybe a lesser known uh, member of the LBGTQ plus community um, to this museum when they come, whether it's through a digital um, pathway or, or into the museum space itself. We are gonna be um, really focused on um, the histories of uh, BIPOC, you know, uh, of queer people of color and transgender and gender non-conforming folks, because we are seeing in this moment that those are the those are the uh, parts of our community that are most directly under fire and that need the most support from the rest of us within the LGBT. LG, LGBTQ plus community um, to show up as allies as, as, and as advocates and to sort of uplift those stories. And, you know, there was such a wave of coming out that happened um, as a result of gay liberation, of the gay liberation movement of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And, you know, we are on a second wave of that that is focused much more on experiences of people who are trans and gender uh, non-conforming. And we all need to support that. Those of us who are cis, those of us who are white, those of us um, uh, you know, who uh, are, are living in ways that, uh, that sort of have greater protection or maybe greater acceptance. We really need to just stand out there. And um, so one of the most exciting aspects of this new venture is the idea that we will be a museum, um, but we will also be a space, a learning space, a school for activists. And we're not quite sure exactly what that looks like. We want to work with other organizations that are training uh, the next generation of activists um, around this work, but we're very excited to be able to be um, a place that will be thinking not just about history and the past, but um, as much about the future. Yeah. And what's so, I'll say one thing, or we'll say two things. One, we're about to do Q&A, so if you have a question, put them in, because we only have a few minutes left of this. So think of your question, write it down, we'll get to there. Um, but I guess piggybacking off of that, you know, I want to turn this more personal to the Senator. And, you know, seeing you here as a journalist, it makes me always think about the importance of representation, especially in politics and the rainbow wave that recently has hit. Um, and how there's just been this ballooning of LGBTQ people finally being elected to office. So could you talk to us a bit about what representation meant for you as you were running for office and now as you were one of the first ever to sit in your position openly gay, what types of stories do you hear from young people coming to you and how do you think it's changing the political future of America? Because I think what Ben, you're saying, what I believe so much is, you know, why the museum matters, why what under, history under race matters, why LGBTQ history matters so much is that if people can look around themselves at their world every day and see people who have lived, that will make them want to continue living and continue being bigger and better. And so Senator, I'd love to hear your perspective on this and how you- that's a, Yeah, that's a big question. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate here in Kansas City, uh, it was kind of the, the core of Kansas City that elected the state's first openly LGBT state representative in 1994, a man who I still to this day know and consider a friend. The first ever openly LGBT Senator, Jolie Justice was elected in 2006 and now myself uh, as number two. Um, it was not that big of an issue as I ran. Uh, here in Kansas City, um, just people were excited to have diversity, but, you know, what are you going to do about our schools? What are you going to do about our roads and bridges, uh, et cetera? Uh, once I was in the capital, so I grew up in a town of about 400 people in a cotton farming community in southeast Missouri. Uh, and I, I found myself in this role where I kind of talk rural. And so I can take urban issues to our rural legislators and explain it to them and vice versa. Uh, and what that has shown me is this is my sixth year in the Capitol building uh, as an elected official. And without fail, every year, 
I get at least one legislator that comes to my office from the other side of the aisle, typically older white rural men who sit down and say, Greg, I hate to say this, but I've never known a gay person well enough to ask questions. And I feel like I can trust you and you're not going to share what I have asked. And that can be as basic as how did you know you were gay, which was a question was like, wow, you know, people are still wondering that. So I had a, a representative a few years ago say, Greg, 10 years ago, I wasn't there with you on lesbian, gay and bisexual issues. Now I am. But I'm not with you on transgender issues. But I have a feeling that 10 years from now, I will be with you. What am I missing? And we had a conversation and he had a really difficult time asking the questions he needed to ask because he didn't have the vocabulary to do it or was afraid to be offensive. And so I just told him, I said, don't worry about it. Say whatever you need to say. The door is closed. I will tell you if you've said something that you shouldn't say publicly afterwards. We had a great conversation. He asked afterwards what, you know, the language I used, okay. And I said, oh, God, no, don't ever say those things out loud. Uh, but that's what he needed. Uh, and so I think it's important for us to have people in place to meet legislators where they're at and kind of their journey of understanding the LGBTQ community. And then the impact, you know, I, I've got to tell you a story about just this year, um, a, a father from the St. Louis area came in with his young uh, son who happened to be transgender. They had met with some legislators and, and I guess those meetings didn't go well. Thankfully, the son didn't quite understand the conversation, but got the sense that these weren't happy meetings. And I was able to sit with that young man and, you know, tell him that he had someone in the building fighting for him. He had somebody that was going to stand on that floor and make sure that the bad guys didn't win. Uh, we then walked out on the Senate floor. Thankfully, the person on the dais at the moment uh, was Senator Lincoln Huff, the, the senator from the Ozarks I was talking about. So uh, that young boy and I went up on the, the dais and he got to look out over the, the discussion of the Senate chamber. And uh, his dad said that I'm now, you know, his, his favorite person, maybe. So just having that impact. And we have so many young people that come into the building. And as a young, closeted, suicidal gay kid growing up in a cotton farm in Missouri, I wish I would have had that. And so it's a, a great honor to be in this position. Um, it's huge. It's huge. It's life-saving. And I'm not being hyperbolic. It is really life-saving for people to see yeah. you there fighting for them. And I, I always tell people, people ask me all the time, uh, do you ever get exhausted from reporting on civil rights movements and all these changes and fights that are happening? And I would say, no, I feel great that I wake up every day and I can see the people in the world who are fighting for my life. And it makes me want to get out of the room and keep fighting with them. And I think you do that too. Um, but similarly, Deb and uh, Rodney, how have students been responding to you having these open conversations about them in history? Are they excited? Do you have kids overwhelmed by the fact that they actually get to see themselves? What has it been like? Oh my goodness, I have so many examples. Before leaving the classroom and co-founding History and Erased over seven years ago now, um, I was bringing in LGBTQ history into my classroom. And I taught new immigrant and refugee students and would have, li literally could have up to 17 different countries represented in one class period. And when I began introducing this content, I knew that at least one of my students desperately needed me to. I knew it was my professional responsibility. And personally, I cared deeply. And, you know, some of my students were coming from Native countries that criminalized homosexuality. And so that was another layer of concern for multiple reasons, you know, you build close relationships with these students and their families because they become a lifeline for their families almost immediately and then their teachers also. But I remember introducing a unit on Bayard Rustin and one of my students came up to me and said, I need to talk to you after class, miss. 
And I thought, shit. And I closed the door and Mohammed said, he's from Iraq. He said, miss, everyone in the world needs to learn about this. This can change the world. Fast forward several years, uh, Mohammed had gone off to college and I was working with History and Erased and he reached out via Facebook. He wanted to meet and share a story with me. And the story was that in one of his college classes, he became very good friends with some two other young men. They did everything together. But he said that uh, one, of the, one of those young men came out to Mohammed and the other as gay and the third young man completely disassociated from him. But Mohammed was so excited to tell me, he said, but miss, because of what I learned in our class, I could understand him better. And we became even better friends. And I love that. It is the power of what this means for LGBTQ identifying youth, but also for non-LGBTQ identifying youth. This, is, this benefits everyone. And there are so many examples of, of students who sometimes they're angry at, at first, that they're just learning about this for the first time. They feel cheated, but they also feel empowered. And that's across the board. Mm, that, that were cheated, Rodney. I feel like you would have stories about this. How how you, know, you began doing this work in the nineties? Mm -hmm. Is that something you were feeling and hearing from students once they learned? Oh, Bayard Rustin is real. He was there the whole time. We need to see reflections of ourselves in media, politics, government, and in history, and we need to see reflections of those who are not like we are in all of those areas as well. It's, it's empowering and it helps create, uh, I think, uh, healthy developmental growth in, in young people. So absolutely, I've seen it again and again where a young person is literally set free when they recognize that they are one, not alone in the here and now, and they also are not alone if you look back in time. So it is empowering, it is liberating, it is, it is a crucial part of what the educational effort must be about. And we just got a question, we only have a few more minutes left, but this question, Rodney, I want to come back, I want to bring to you now, and someone asked, what's the coolest piece of LGBTQ history you've discovered during this work? Uh, and for you over the years, what is something that you love teaching and talking about uh, with students? Oh, that's a great question. There's so much. It's hard to pinpoint specifically. Um, I just recently, and happened to have it here, um, came across this book, and they were wonderful teachers, uh, Florida's Purge of Gay and Lesbian Teachers that a lot of people don't know about. And this isn't a happy book to read, but it's an important book to read because it shows how time and time again, and you know, we've got the don't say gay bill in Florida right now. We remember Anita Bryant in the 1970s. Well, this was the 1950s to the 1960s in part a response actually to the Brown decision in 1954, uh, the Supreme Court desegregation case. Um, but I found reading this book to be uplifting in this sense that in the end, those who wanted to say teachers who are gay or lesbian cannot be in the classroom, in the end, they didn't win. Now, there were a few dozen teachers who were removed. Uh, the chilling effect was pervasive. Uh, obviously, you had the 1970s with Anita Bryant, so things didn't improve much in Florida. And here we are talking about this now. Uh, but at least in my recent life, in the last year, I think this book, I didn't know anything about this. Did anyone know anything about this? What's the title? I think someone's asking for the title. And they were wonderful teachers, Florida's Purge of Gay and Lesbian Teachers by Karen Graves. Mm -hmm. It was new news to me. That's, but that's the why LGBTQ history must be taught, because it's always surprising, even to all of us who are experts. Yeah. Uh, so we'll have a few minutes left, and there's a question that I would love someone to answer, because I think it can be broad too, but someone asked, what's the best advice you can give to a teacher about beginning, um, beginning the activities routine who wants to make sure that all students feel welcome and safe in their classrooms? So I know a few of you work specifically with students. Um, so what advice would you have? And then for everyone else, what's, what's some best practices for engaging with people to make sure they feel good when having these hard conversations? There is um, 
a wonderful podcast that History and Erased produced with our friends and partners at, with Eric and Making Gay History, where um, on Erasing LGBTQ History and Identity is a podcast for teachers, where one middle school teacher conveys a really powerful and important message. And that is that conveying to your students that you're trying to be inclusive and trying to get it right is the point and not to let the fear or the, don't let the perfect get in the way of the good. And to be really open and clear with your students that this is what you want to provide for all students and let them lead you with language. I know the, the language is often daunting for educators, but you know, providing that open space to initiate conversations about um, what does an inclusive classroom look like? And how can I demonstrate my intention to honor and respect all of your identities that step into this classroom? If I may, I'll just uh, point out one more book, uh, The Educator's Guide to LGBT Plus Inclusion. And this is specifically for K through 12 uh, staff and teachers, uh, Chris Shane. Um, I would highly recommend it as a resource of ideas for how to do just what you were saying, Zach. Uh, make certain that your classroom is a place where everyone is welcome and everyone is comfortable and everyone is included because, you know, you cannot learn to read well, write well, think well, do math well, and understand history well if you don't feel comfortable and safe, safe in the space in which you're being taught those subjects. Amen. The truth. The full truth. Uh, Senator, what advice do you have for folks who want to reach, um, let's say, not as friendly politicians that are in your caucus or that you sit with? What are ways that we can maybe get them to hear us a little bit better? <laughs> you know, that, that is, um, there are some folks that I serve with that I am just going to say are unreachable. Uh, and if you come to a Capitol building, you're, wherever you're at in your Capitol building, find out who those people are and mark them off your list. Go to the folks who probably, if they have to take a vote on an LGBT issue today, are going to vote against us. But maybe with a few conversations, we can start to move and go talk to them and make it personal. Uh, when I talk on the Senate floor, I don't, I, I, always include our whole community, but I will ask legislators, you know, why should I still have to worry that I'm gonna be kicked out of my apartment in Jefferson City? It's still perfectly legal for my landlord to evict me because he finds out I'm a gay man. Why is that okay in this state? And make them answer that question to you uh, and, and whatever it is you're dealing with. And then also, be respectful of where they are and their understanding. Um, you know, don't get angry if they don't fully understand what it means to be transgender, because this is a new subject to a lot of Americans. Uh, so meet them where they're at and help them take the next step. Uh, and step by step, we have the roadmap. And, and this museum is, is amazing and, and it's going to help so many people see LGB people, you know, we're just farther along uh, in acceptance in our community. And the downside is, is that our transgender family is behind. The good news is we have the roadmap if we know our history. We have the roadmap to, to get to that full inclusion. Mm -hmm. Going personal is always the best route. The personal is political, as feminists have famously stated over and over. Uh, and meeting people where they're at is also great advice. This works on anything, an argument, our rights, it's always what you need to know. So we are at time and I will let Ben, if you'd like to say anything about the next year is your first, it's actually your first month with us. Um, but I will let you say anything you'd like and then we'll, we, are, we are done after this. <laughs> Thanks so much, Zach, and thank you for moderating this. Um, it's been just a wonderful conversation. I'm so inspired by our three, our three guests. 
these three amazing public servants who are just making us all stronger and safer um, because of your work. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, we're really excited to continue hosting these conversations virtually. We'll be having more coming up. Please go to um, our website. Um, I, most of you probably have are already on our mailing list, um, but if you're not, please join them so you can find out uh, the progress as, as it moves forward. But we are doing a lot of planning for the physical facility. We are doing a lot of planning for uh, for virtual and in-person programs that we'll be doing over the next um, few years before our, our physical site opens up uh, in late uh, in late 2024, the, the building should be completed. Um, and um, just keep an eye on, uh, uh, on all the different events that we're gonna be bringing forward. We're really excited to be focusing in different parts of the country in different uh, parts of the L LGBTQ uh, experience and we'll just continue to move that forward. So thank you everyone so much. Um, it's been an incredible night. It has, and thank you to everyone. This was wonderful. I'm leaving inspired uh, and it's not even the weekend yet. So thank you for giving me a little more pump to get through tomorrow. Uh, this uh, conversation will be available on the museum's website and everyone here is available on twitter.com if you have any further questions. So thank you again to our panelists and everyone have a wonderful night and stay safe. Thank you so much, everyone.